evening. Um, I'm just recording this meeting. Um, one important thing is that normally for the carrier interest group meetings, we record them, but we don't post them. While in Purple WRT meetings, we do post them, so people in, in the general uh, Open WRT League community um, can see it. If it's all right with everyone, um, I'd like to just post this uh, it, since it's it's a Purple WRT meeting and a CIG meeting. Is that fine with everyone? All right. Well, I don't hear any any uh, um, anyone saying no, so we will go ahead uh, under that. If someone has any concerns, then we will uh, we'll deal with that after the fact. Um, again, thank you. My two two page slideshow uh, got to the end. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, amazing turnout. Uh, this is a one and a half hour meeting because to simplify scheduling for when it relates to um, uh, to Felix's time in particular, but you know, just in general, um, Felix actually is going to do a presentation on UBus and DBus. This was a request that we had had uh, um, maybe a month ago to try to so people could understand the difference, just kind of see what the difference is. And then we're going to have um, the discussion, the CIG discussion, as it relates to Wi-Fi and how we can standardize. There's a couple different ways to look at the problem, so I kind of want to. Uh, uh, make sure we all want to make sure that we can we can understand that. So uh, with with no further ado, I will uh, give uh, presenter power to Felix so he can uh, share his screen and present. All right, you should have it, Felix. Awesome. So uh, can you guys see the the window that I'm sharing, the presentation window? Yep. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, then I'll get started right away and I'll try to keep the presentation part short so that uh, we have more time for discussing the parts that, that people, are, people are most interested in. So I decided to just do very, very short high-level comparison of DBus and UBus as it relates to our use in the OpenWRT and Leap project. So when I started out designing UBus, uh, the main purpose that I had in mind was to start making system services accessible through remote procedure calls. Because uh, the, one, of, one of my biggest concerns with uh, C that, uh, and the way we're, we were developing components there, that it was always a hassle to make things talk to each other and to start integrating things. So I decided to fix that with a common piece of code that we put in there. Um, and I wanted this to really be the, uh, the basis for integration between services, to not just have some, some daemon sitting there, each of them loading its configuration and reacting to a SIG hub or something, but to actually make things uh, accessible in a, in a system-wide way. And because we are using not just C code, but also shell scripts and various other scripting languages, it needed to be easily accessible as well. So when I looked at the landscape of existing RPC implementations, um, I took a close look at Dbus and very quickly found many reasons not to use it. One of the really big initial concerns was uh, the size of the whole thing. So I just, for this presentation today, did a comparison on the same architecture, um, just what's the binary size of Dbus with just the core parts that are necessary uh, and UBus itself the, um, on, the, on the state that it is in currently. And UBus came out with 418 kilobytes uncompressed plus an extra dependency that we didn't have in the base system. And that's already way more than we really should need for such a comparatively simple piece of functionality. So uh, for reference, uh, UBus including the daemon, the library, uh, the command line tool and everything comes down to just 45 kilobytes uncompressed, which is much more suitable for the small systems that uh, we still support. But actually, the, the mo more important factor was the usability of the C API, or lack thereof. Actually, um, when I looked at the documentation of the, of the C API, it says if you use this low-level API directly, you're signing up for some pain which is not very encouraging if you actually want developers to, to pick it up and start doing things with it. And I took a look at uh, some existing uh, daemons that are out there that use the Dbus API 
to do something similar to what we had in mind. And I found basically in every single one of them huge amounts of boilerplate code and it's, it's really a lot of code for very simple functionality and I decided that this just couldn't be it and there was just too much complexity and unwanted features involved. And for me, the, the very important reason to design things the way that I designed them is to, to keep it as simple as possible and make it easy for people to adopt them. So Dbus was pretty much the opposite of what I needed. And I, th I guess for the desktop world, this is mostly fine because almost nobody uses the C API. Uh, people use uh, the glib API or um, I, I guess there's uh, some cute variant of it as well and there's Python and all these heavy scripting languages uh, that have their own bindings for Dbus that I, I imagine are much more convenient to use than the C API. But for our purposes, the C API really matters because we cannot just bear the cost of these extra uh, language implementations. So when I, uh, when I started designing Ubus, uh, actually, well, it, it obviously needed to be tiny. So even with the features that we've added over time, like ACL support, uh, different ways of sending messages and uh, various other features that we added, the, the main daemon that handles all the messaging still comes, comes out with 16 kilobytes uncompressed code. So it's very small, it's very easy to review, and there really isn't all that much uh, that is worth taking away. And that's, uh, I think that goes a long way in making it accessible as well, because people can just start reading the source code and find that it's just not uh, not all that scary and big as many of the other implementations. I actually put a lot of thought into the C API as well. I wanted to make sure that you could pretty much take any existing piece of source code that runs as a daemon, regardless of whether it has its own event loop or not, and just you can just take that uh, and add maybe 20 or 30 lines of code and suddenly it uh, talks with a system-wide API in a very extensible way. And as I mentioned before, it's accessible through scripting languages as well, such as uh, Shell or Lua. And when I actually uh, was designing Ubus and was thinking about what data format to use, I, I decided to use uh, a format that's JSON compatible, not because I already had the, the website of it in mind, but, but because it is just a simple format and there's parser libraries that are small enough uh, to be suitable for small-scale embedded systems. And it was only after I made that choice that I realized that this would be a really nice way to connect browser-side JavaScript code with uh, the system code in, in a nice way as well. And for that, obviously, security is important, so uh, everything that's accessible to, to the browser side needs to be explicitly whitelisted. There's no default access to everything. So what the, what the API of UBUS comes down to is really a simple object-based API. You can register objects, you can make calls on objects somewhere else on the system, and they end up getting translated to C calls, or if you use uh, Lua to implement an object, you get Lua calls, and uh, with with a language like Lua, you actually get full conversion of the data into the, the native data format that the language uses. So tables and, and numbers and everything. <clears throat> you don't have to interact with it through uh, JSON parsing or things like that directly. And so in addition to simple object calls, you also have the possibility of uh, object events and their notifications. And they can actually be used not just to have one object that provides notifications that everybody else uh, that subscribes to it receives, but they can also return uh, a status code indicating of how the message was processed. So you could have something which I also did for Scale, where there's an ACL object that uh, doesn't really allow any calls, but if something in, in the, in the Scale daemon wants to check whether a particular call is okay, it just sends out a, not, a single notification on the object, and if something else subscribed to that, it can use that to indicate whether the call should be accepted or not. So it's, uh, can be, it's a clever way to connect objects in a way where 
you don't have to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You don't have to have complex reference tracking of objects. It really makes a lot of the common use cases very simple. And in addition to that, we also have uh, global events for things that are happening on the system where it's not really specified uh, who might be interested in that. And it just allows an easy way to receive all of them. And now I'm hoping that based on that, you guys have some good questions for me on what you're actually interested in uh, in the comparison, especially between UBAS and DBAS. Hey, Felix, th thank you so much for the presentation. This is really clear to the point, and, and, and congratulations for the great work there. It's impressive. One tenth, <clears throat> one tenth of the size say, says a lot, and, and we definitely love the speaking about tens of kilobytes rather than hundreds. Uh, my, my question, as you might expect, is what kind of security measures have you taken in the design of this system? Is there any authentication anywhere? What, 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 what's the security posture of this piece of code? Well, um, I mean, at the moment, the UBAS daemon still runs as root, but this is something that, that we can easily fix as well. Um, I, my main focus regarding security is just reviewing the code and keeping it as simple as possible to kind of minimize the potential for, for security errors. And uh, in terms of uh, access control for, for that, that part of security, um, by default, only root can access things that you publish on the object. Anything that needs to be accessible to non-root users uh, needs to be explicitly whitelisted uh, to allow access to that. So if you just open up a, a service uh, on, on UBUS and you don't add any ACL entries or nothing, then it's only accessible to root by default. And that's good. Is there any concept of uh, uh, containerization for the objects or, or the method executed on objects? Keep them separated somehow from the rest of the environment? It's, uh, it's not part of the core, but we have uh, Containerize, some containerization support in, in Procti, which is our uh, init replacement, and it can do pass through, so it can pass UBUS to uh, the separate namespace, but everything in that namespace will not show up as root, it will show up as a non-privileged user, so uh, it cannot access many things by default. Thank you, Felix. All right. Uh, were there any other questions that folks had? Walter, it's Walter. It's really hard to hear you. You're very you're very muffled. Okay, then I might need to switch to calling in instead of using computer audio. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, my my comments weren't very important. They were just in support of what uh, Felix has said, so um, you can skip them. You can skip this. I will <laughs> call in the meantime. Okay, that that's fine. All right. Um, any other questions or comments that folks had? All right. Well, apparently you you uh, you helped everyone understand it very well, Felix. So. Uh, Thank you uh, for the presentation, and also thank you for the the amazing work on on UBUS. Great, thanks. Thank you. All and, right, and Eric, just just yep. a, just an idea, quick one. Uh, I think this is very very valuable. So eventually, if there are other key components of the overall uh, OpenWRT slash LIDI distribution that uh, may offer an opportunity to do a presentation like this, I, I think that's definitely worth it. Uh, but it's up definitely to, to, to the community to figure out what are these pieces and they find interest. But I think this is what really OpenWRT uh, is uh, and Lydia. And so uh, I would like to see probably a few more of these uh, uh, key design components uh, explained and, and compared with what is, for instance, the standard Debian distribution. Definitely. Just an idea. Yeah. That, that'd be, that's, a, that's a really good idea. I think we should do that if we, if we can do that. If we can, if we can get the people to do it, that's a good idea. If there idea. is interest in, in any other particular component that I designed, uh, I can do something similar for other things as well. Well, I'm personally very interested, but I don't want to obviously hijack the, the thing. So, if, if there is a common shared interest, 
and, it's, and, and Felix, it's, it's totally up to you to identify what are the most important one, the most relevant. And I really like this parallel, making a comparison, because it really shows the value of, of open RBRT leading. It's not just redoing something, but for a reason, and I mean, that size, and perhaps also a little bit of working examples, perhaps just you show one call that you would do in, in, in one U-Bus system compared to the other one, show the overhead or something like that. Not for this one, this one is done, mm. for the next one, so on. But again, I don't want to hijack this. It's food for thought for, for the group. Sure. Definitely. I, I think I, I also like this because this um, um, this almost is documentation. Um, I don't think we have to hide it from anyone that uh, people often often feel uncomfortable or don't fully understand uh, OpenWRT lead documentation or how to use features. So it's nice to kind of get this out kind of in their face. This is what it is and this is how it works and here's why we did it, that kind of stuff. So. And Eric, if I'm allowed just one minute, sure. I just want you to, 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 to give two thumbs up to, to the whole uh, OpenWRT Lady uh, big family. I'm coming back from, uh, as, as some of the people in this call, from Embedded World. I spent uh, a few days there and I presented and attended most of the presentation in the conference track. And uh, I can tell you, OpenWRT was coming up all the time in all the slides. So guys, you're doing an incredibly good job, not just for routing devices, but for uh, embedded in general. I was surprised really to see uh, OpenWRT popping up in all the slides in different contexts. So you, you're defin uh, definitely g getting noticed out there. That was just kudos to you guys. Nice, thanks. All right. Well, well one, one question, oh, yeah. uh, this is Eddie mm -hmm. uh, from Intel. Um, yeah, maybe I, I missed it. Uh, is there any use of UBUS uh, um, outside of OpenWRT environment? Um, I don't. I, I can't provide many specific examples there, but I do uh, occasionally get emails from random unexpected uh, unexpected places where people just take UBUS and adapt it to their own environment and. I don't have a lot of insight into what they're doing, but based on the emails that I get and feedback and patches, I see that there's a lot of use for uh, for it as well outside of the OpenWRT and lead context. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And for example, some capability of uh, support over micro. Uh, over multiple processor, for example, I know that DBus okay can be extended even to. Uh, to multiple CPU environment, right? Okay, so bus can be extended. Okay, here I see communication over Unix domain socket. It, can it can it use? Right. Okay, just just regular uh, regular socket. Okay, for for communication over yeah, over bus with different CPUs. Um, I intentionally did not add any network uh, support for it. So. Uh, there's, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so uh, Silas worked on a project where they um, they used an implementation of web sockets um, that allows uh, other kind of other CPUs to connect over to the network and also communicate with the bus, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not it's not in the core and it's intentionally not in the core. Uh, because something like that requires some extra security review, and you need to have you need to be careful about permissions and trust relationship bet between the different CPUs and everything. And I wanted to make sure that this is out of scope for the main implementation and can just easily be added on top. Okay. Okay. And uh, for example, integration with some uh, containers. Uh, Portions, uh, yeah, uh, units, components. It, it can be done. It can be done. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can pass the the socket into a container. Um, shouldn't mm -hmm. be a problem. Uh, okay. If you want to have something where you want to r run a regular distribution in the container that also uses UBus, it might make sense to kind of differentiate between a local bus inside the container and uh, an extra socket. Uh, that can communicate with things outside of the container, but uh, that's easily possible, and you could have multiple instances and multiple sockets concurrently, and just uh, select the one that you need from from the service that you're running. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thanks, Felix. Hi, Felix. This is just a question. Is there any form of prioritization within UBUS? Are there different levels? Is there a high priority, low priority capability? Mm -hmm. Everything sent at the same priority level? Um, at the moment, it's all the same priority uh, because I, I intentionally chose to not uh, really add a lot of work to making it high performance for processing lots of messages or large messages um, because I, uh, I wanted to keep things simple. And if you, um, if you have components on the system that need to exchange a lot of messages, uh, you could just use UBUS to pass a file descriptor between those processes and then send data over that directly. Walter here, I'm back in the meantime. Um, so I just wanted to point out that because we also looked at DBus when we started um, uh, developing our own bus a couple of years before UBus, um, and we looked at the exact same reasons as Felix uh, were the ones that we used. Uh, in addition, we had um, additional problems that we discovered in DBus. Was one of them was the lack of uh, getters and setters, and we wanted to map it to TR69, and everything is a object with parameters. In the meantime, that's been implemented in DBus, so that's, uh, that's okay now. Uh, the uh, performance was an issue, uh, mostly due to an extremely poor implementation of serialization in, uh, uh, in DBus. Uh, there have been some performance improvements in the last couple of years in DBus. Uh, it's still performing much worse than our own implementation, but it is at least to an acceptable level. Um, Another tricky thing, the API was absolutely a problem <laughs> a few years back. Uh, GDBus, which is GLib-based, is allegedly better than uh, the DBus API that existed at the time uh, when UBus and, and RPCB was developed. I just looked, took a look at the API, and I still think it's really complicated compared to what it needs to be. But uh, And there's a dependency on GLib, so it'll be large, so there are still those concerns. And at least at the time, the documentation of the old API was extremely uh, poor in the sense that you had no idea if you were using the C API or anything at a higher level if you needed to allocate memory or free it of whatever you called the, uh, the API with or what it, what it returned, which uh, almost guaranteed led to double freeze, uh, memory leaks, and that sort of thing, because developers were, just weren't clear what to do. Um, that might have been, might be better now in uh, in GDBus. Thank you, thank you, Walter. Um, just uh, a few more minutes uh, on this topic, and then we probably should move on. So, are any other questions, comments? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add a quick comment since Walter was touching the subject of uh, memory management. This is also something that I put a strong emphasis on in, in UBUS and also in the, in the core library that, that implement, for instance, uh, the message format uh, that it uses. Uh, I design things in a way to make memory management as simple as possible so you don't have to have lots of malloc's and freeze and everywhere in your allocation and at the same time you're not handing over, uh, handing over um, memory management to something else that could also then run into object lifetime issues. So it, it's a lot of it is really based around encapsulation. So you can uh, you can put UBus objects in your own data structures. You could put the UBus context in your own data structures. And with messages, there's also a simple buffer library that you can just stick it anywhere in your own data structures and tie the lifetime to that. Uh, so you, there's really, it, it takes a lot of complexity out of the memory management aspects of this. Um, just one question. Have you tried also to support HTTP, HTTPS? And uh, one other question, if uh, how many services have you tried to, to implement on this uh, UBUS? I mean, do you have a problem with uh, scalability? So we're working mostly with embedded devices where 
the amount of uh, bus traffic that's going on is rather low because it's mostly for things like querying uh, the state of services or dealing with some configuration issues. So we haven't run into any real performance or scalability issues with it. And uh, in terms of making things use it, um, I haven't I haven't added UBus support to a lot of uh, things that other people develop. But for for the OpenWRT and the lead system, a large portion of the core components just use UBus directly and rely heavily on it. Right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Um, with that, then, uh, thank you, Felix. Uh, fantastic. Um, and I think this will be very, very helpful for other people as well. So, thank you. Sure. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Eric, Eric, Sorry, Eric, 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 where, where, where do we post that PowerPoint? Um, Felix, could you email that to the uh, purple WRT list? And I can also post it uh, in the Carrier Interest Group Basecamp. Uh, sure, I can do that. Okay, sounds good. Someone else was saying something, I think? Yeah, it was me, Pedro, Eric, yep. but it was already answered. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So um, I guess with that, we'll move on to the carrier interest group part of the, part of the uh, discussion. Um, I have a, pre a short presentation just to kind of, I think, summarize things to date. Um, one of the problems that it, it felt like we, um, we kept having in the carrier interest group is, is we're kind of looking at two different levels of how, um, how you can come up with common APIs and it may be good to understand wh where we're talking to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, but I will uh, will let uh, Pasquale, uh, since you are one of the co-chairs, obviously I'll let you take it. And if you'd like me to present, I'm happy to at any time. Yeah, I'm here. Unfortunately, uh, I have to leave in very few minutes. So <laughs> I leave to you and, and all to you know my colleagues from ADB that are, by the way, on the line, so okay. unfortunately. No problem, no problem. Thank you, Pasquale. Yes, I, 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 was, I was joining because I, want, you know, I wanted to, to listen and to watch the, the Felix presentation, of course, but unfortunately I cannot stay longer, unfortunately. Sorry for this. Okay, no problem, Pasquale. Um, as long as, if it's fine with everyone else, uh, unless there's any concerns, I'll, I'll kind of go through a summary of where we are in, the, in our discussion, the problem we're trying to solve to, you know, reiterate it and make sure that we, we all fully understand where we are and kind of different ways of addressing this problem. All right. Um, so, uh, like I said, I was, uh, I, I was, I wanted to kind of summarize the carrier interest group. Um, I know we have some different people here today, so I want to summarize kind of what we've done so far, the problem we're trying to solve, and uh, the different ways we can address it. Because I think we, um, the group has multiple ways of wanting to address it, and they're, they're at different levels of the stack. Um, I think that they're both valuable, but uh, I think it's important to make sure that where we're talking to be very clear in what we're, what we're intending on doing. So, so right now, this kind of is if summarizes the current state for um, for wireless LAN. It's not a a perfect technical graph. It's kind of just summarizing that. Let's say you have OpenWRT lead or some other distribution based on it, uh, and you want to connect. You want to connect to the uh, a Wi-Fi driver. Currently, the the way that is kind of recommended in the Linux kernel is CFG 802.11 which is by and large what OpenWRT supports. It does, I believe, support also the, um, uh, the, the Broadcom driver, uh, I think, although I think it's more limited. Um, am I correct with that, Felix? Uh, yeah, so we do have the Broadcom driver and uh, there's 
I think we had some other drivers as well in the past that are also supported, um, but it's um, it, it, it's so and so. Most of it should work reasonably well, but the best supported option is obviously it's CFT 802.11. Okay. Yeah. So so that's that's generally what o OpenWRT supports. Now, uh, to take into account that there are also uh, in some cases though, like Company One, for example, that would might be the Broadcom. Uh, driver stack. Company two could be a different one. So they're all kind of doing the same thing, but they're all doing them slightly different ways. And because of that, OpenWRT lead has to support all of those different ways. Um, and it's difficult, obviously, to get them all to be, be equivalent. Now to expand this to a, to a larger, um, a, a kind of larger industry problem, OpenWRT is often the basis of the board support packages um, or the board support or Linux in general is is a um, the basis of of board support packages from a number of different uh, silicon vendors, and in those cases they don't all use CFG eight hundred two eleven. Uh, so, like I said, there's the Broadcom one, there's the there's w Company two, there's whatever, um, and because of that, it's it becomes very difficult for vendors to actually uh, integrate over time and to integrate um, across different. Uh, different Wi-Fi stacks and different Wi-Fi drivers. So to expand here, people have, you have the OpenWRT lead stack, you have the RDKB stack, and you have the custom Linux stack. They all have to have some level of, uh, of an integration layer to work with um, CFG 802.11 and the different companies' Wi-Fi drivers. And of course, there aren't just three of these. There's you know, there, there could be, there's probably hundreds of these different custom Linux stacks, and they're all done slightly differently, and they all have to support, in, in many cases, uh, have to support it slightly differently. Um, there isn't a standard integration layer um, that is used between all of them to support all the different types of uh, companies and their, and uh, kind of standards for Wi-Fi APIs. So, while we use um, WLAN as the example, it's not the only um, only uh, integration problem. You also have things like the GPIO, which is also not the same between every company. Um, so you have SysFS, which is kind of like the official version, but there's people that have slightly different ways of handling it, and uh, or or totally different um, different uh, drivers and and and, uh, and different APIs, and there's no consistency. Um, generally. So when you start to get this out to the different distributions, this is becoming a very large problem and it prevents people from, from moving be their distribution between different, different uh, silicon vendors and software between those, those distributions in any way because it's, it's so much integration support. Additionally, over time, these, um, because, they're, because people aren't necessarily stuck to a standard, or a common API, like the one that's in the Linux kernel, people aren't necessarily quite as um, diligent in making sure that the APIs don't change over time because they define the API and it, it, it becomes quite difficult over time. So that's one level of the problem. This is, this is mostly um, at a, it, it's not necessarily the kernel level, but it's very low level. It doesn't go through a bus quite specifically. It's pretty important to mention that, that it does not involve the bus. Um, this is lower than that, um, or at least this is lower than that. Um, but there is a different way of looking at this problem because there's also the issue of you can't move things between the uh, pieces of software, for example, the web admin between different distributions because they, they all get information from the distribution in a different way. Um, for example, I'm, I'm using this, this example is, uh, here is that uh, a web admin that you're running on OpenWRT lead is getting information about, say, the Wi-Fi or um, the state of the system in some way or uh, what software is running. And it's using things like UBUS, it's using UCI, and it's using Shell. Um, in the case of RDKB, uh, for the most part, it's uh, using Dbus, although I think there's some work to add Ubus, but even then they're not going to be using probably the same APIs or, or the same object models. Um, there's, you know, in a, some example uh, interface or some example configuration, something what I'm not exactly sure, but 
I guarantee it there's some sort of configuration um, management there, as well as uh, shell scripts. Um, and in your custom Linux, it's your custom bus, it's, and it's other things like that. Now, to make this worse, that's only one web admin. Uh, in the case of, of multiple web admins, like from different companies, they're all doing it slightly differently. The information that they're taking, they're taking different bits of information. It's not all the same because they have slightly different things to do. Um, it's not complete because, you know, web admin one comes from company A and company A just implements the things that they need for their, their web admin. Company B does, does the things they need for their web admin, but they may not be exactly the same. Therefore, they're not done not only in the same way, but they're also not covering the same um, use cases. Um, so in most cases, companies, uh, I, this is, this is a, a little bit of a, um, a, a leap here. Well, I mean, it's not a leap, but, but if I understand correctly that like Intel, for example, they have, they have an adapter that they use for, uh, to make things work uh, between OpenWRT lead, RDKB, and RDKB, because those are their two stacks. So there's some, some adapter here. Um, so if you look at the purple, we have, we have the, these adapter, and we're saying that they work between all the Linux systems. Then you get a standard um, object model or, um, or uh, APIs and things like that. Uh, now, the, a different company will do it a slightly different way in their adapter. Um, so they can make it work on OpenWRT, RDKB, and, and their custom adapter. And that's in the brown. And in each of these cases, these aren't complete. These are all custom, custom made. And therefore, companies um, are doing a lot of repeated work that could, could be done um, by the industry and the community. Um, and... Uh, and none of these are, um, are shared between anyone. So if you look at the problem as a whole, it gets pretty complex really quick. So the question is, what are we, going, what are we doing in the carrier interest group to, and how should we fix this problem? Now there's a couple different ways of doing this. We can look at this lower layer. And again, the, the problems here are, there's a complex proprietary adaption layers for hardware, for the drivers. Um, Integration between the versions can be difficult, and the community versions of software often can't be used to officially support drivers and vice versa, because let's say um, someone has an OpenWRT lead-based uh, board support package, um, because they're using, in some cases, uh, proprietary uh, driver APIs or, or things that are not fully supported in, in upstream, uh, that can't be just swapped in and out. The, the upstream and therefore people can't use the um, you can't use upstream OpenWRT or lead because you, and you're not getting all the all the new features that, of OpenWRT and lead and this in general this slows down development and slows down the use of these very useful features and these important um, improvements over time um, so the proposal on how we how to handle this is is we talked about in um, uh, October and November a little bit, and, and we've been moving on, um, was that the BSPs and distros support commonly agreed upon drivers and mechanisms. It's not much problem for the distributions, particularly like OpenWRT lead, because they're generally t using um, the standard as much as a standard exists. Um, but the CIG and the others will work through recommended APIs in cases where they're, they're, it's not clear, or to just summarize that, you know, if you're doing WLAN, you should do CFG 802.11, and get the agreement between vendors to actually support these. Um, we have made some progress on that. We had we had a meeting in October uh, in Santa Clara, and we got agreement between uh, Qualcomm and Intel to support CFG 802.11 in their BSPs. Um, and then later, we had uh, uh, a few months later, we got agreement between a Broadcom to do that. Um, I didn't mention it here, but Imagination Technologies already supports CFG 802.11, so they they also support that. Um, and uh, Walter has kind of headed up the work on coming up with a formal document just to say this is what the CFG 802.11, this is our recommendation. You're using CFG 802.11 and here's why you're using it. it it's um, not much more than that, but it does get us kind of just formalized because it was a little more um, a casual agreement uh, without necessarily written down before we agreed. So. If this group wants to, we can move forward and then have, have people review that um, later. Now there's, 
let's look at the second side of this problem. Um, right now at this at this bus level, and I'm using bus level as kind of a um, a catch-all because there are things that are involved in in the UCI and shell um, or things like that. But it, it, in the key is that there is that this is mostly I think of it as not just user level, but um, even higher than that. The problem we have is there's no consistent APIs between versions of a distribution. Um, and that's not and that's not bad. These the distributions aren't actually you know haven't committed to to keep consistent APIs or consistent uh, data models. Um, you can't easily reuse software between distributions. Um, you can't move your web admin to RDKB and just be like you know spend you know four hours of of you know debugging and be done. It's not like that. It's like you're basically reimplementing the whole thing from scratch in some cases. Um, and on top of it, these adapters that people do create, they're all custom built by company or project, and they're not complete. In most cases, they're not open source. Um, so one of the things that we've proposed in the last few months, and we're, we're still working, it seems like we're still working through, is the idea that there should be a software stack independent API. The carrier interest group would define a standard object model to publish on the bus. And we say bus in this case is whatever bus that, that the distribution uses. Um, however, it would be basically the, it would be the same object model. You'd still, if you were look, getting information about a Wi-Fi adapter or the operations on a Wi-Fi adapter, it'd be the same thing for all of them. Um, whether you're getting it off of U-bus or D-bus as appropriate, um, and then there would be an adapter created and maintained for each distribution and lightweight adapters for each bus system, which then gets you you have standard libraries and things like that. Um, so. There are two possible paths for the carrier interest group, and I wanted to make sure that we fully understood where we were in the current um, and where to go, is that we have this low-level API discussion, which we've made a little progress on. Um, we also have the software stack independent API, which, which we're, we're still pretty early, but there seems to be some interest in that. Or th we could potentially do both, and there may be, may be some use cases for that, because while the low-level API will simplify a lot of things for people who want to use um, for particularly the open source distributions as well as people who want to do some low level customization and and things that are are very um that require the entire stack to be taken into account to you know your distribution there's use for the software stack independent api because now you have the ability to take you know a web admin and just move it between different different platforms you can you can and it's not just web admins it's things like um potentially you know services and, and all kinds of things that are useful. So I guess now that I've now that I've summarized as I understand it, do people feel that that is um, that I've properly described the current state or uh, is there any concerns about how I described it and um, I guess we can go from there. Walter here. Um, it's a, it's a pretty good high level overview. Um, I might add, well, you know that I have a slide with more, more complexity. Yes. <laughs> uh, going more into a lot more detail. Uh, one of the elements is that the bus itself isn't, uh, is only one aspect. Uh, if you have the services on top of that, so let's say that you have a web UI that needs to get to the wireless LAN status and configuration, you'll uh, not only have a difference between um, OpenWRT, which uses UBUS and UCI, versus uh, RDKB, which uses uh, DBUS, you'll have the problem that even on DBUS, um, I can think that the RDKB exposes one form of a of a data model, uh, but on top of DBUS, on the in the in the rest of the Linux world, there's also a network manager, um, Wikity, um, and in a more in the embedded world, Comman. All of those three also expose their API over DBus, and they're all completely incompatible, of course, and incompatible with the RDKB. So there's an, there's an additional layer of incompatibility. So I think you're making the good point that there's standardization needed at the low level um, towards the network uh, interfaces and the wireless network interfaces. And there's a good point for making some sort of standard, doing some sort of standardization or convergence at the layer of the bus or what's just behind the bus, the, the service exposing the wireless management. Okay, yeah, definitely. And, and I, 
mean, I kind of overlooked and maybe a little too much uh, hand wavy, but when I say the OpenWRT adapter or the RDKB adapter in this picture, I'm very specifically saying this is the thing that takes, whether it's network manager or you take uh, con, con manager or whatever you take, and then you, you say, I'm going to then take that information and take, and take the APIs of that, and then I'm going to put it in this standard um, object model that I'm going to push onto DBus, or in the case of OpenWRT, I'm taking you know whatever and I'm pushing that into UBus. It's going to look that object model will look the same, but th that adapter is is key. That has to be there, or obviously we are not converging on anything at that point. So definitely. Yeah. Right. All right. All right. Any other questions, comments? Um, I just one said. concern, sorry, uh, one concern that I have with this object model is uh, I think it, we, we would need a very well-defined scope for what this, this object model is really for because I see a lot of potential for feature creep of uh, lots of random loosely coupled things being added there uh, just because somebody needs it for some pet project. and. Uh, um, I think it's very useful to keep the, the scope of the whole thing under type control. Just, just um, can I just ask a general sure. question? This is Duncan. Mm -hmm. um, on the object model, um, how 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 similar or different would this be, say, for, than than, for example, what they've developed in tier sixty nine to? Um, is there any? Is it is it totally at a different level, or am I thinking in the right um, ballpark there? You know, or to, you know the uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I think one of the uh, I can actually um, uh, respond to actually both of these. Um, I think is that one, one idea that people have brought up, and and again, we're, we're st I think we're still really early, and we need. I think some, uh, you know, we need to really hash through how we want to move forward on the software stack independent API. So people have brought up the idea of TR-181 as being at, like a place to start. It's very large and, and you may not cover everything. You may not take the entire thing, but that may be something that gets you at least part of the way there. There's also the ideas like what's in RDKB, maybe that's a, a good example. But I think what you're saying there is, is um, not a bad, a bad place to like think so to start. Uh, and with RD, I don't. I'm not really that familiar with RDK. But what have they done? Have they, have they built on those TR 181 concepts, or is it completely orthogonal? My understanding Walter, here, my, maybe. I, oh, yeah, go yeah, ahead, Walter. Yeah. Uh, indeed, um, both um, both RDKB and we ourselves at Top Platform have taken TR181 as a basis and then dramatically extended it and not implemented everything that's in TR181 as Eric pointed out before. Um, okay. One thing you need to know about TR181 is, and TR69 in general is that you have no function calls, you have no sensible form of uh, eventing um, and therefore you have a it's extremely limited what you can do. It's, it's objects and parameters that are static, and it doesn't define, for example, that uh, if you want to do, um, if you make several changes, it doesn't define if you make a change whether that's uh, active immediately or if it's active after first disabling and enabling the interface. So it's it's really weak. So where it's where it's where it's powerful in is in that it's the only sort of standard data model that captures a uh, radio access point and a station configuration uh, in the various parameters that there are, but it doesn't define dynamic behavior and it's not very good at interacting with uh, in a dynamic way. Is it very, um, so what you're saying is from a functional perspective it's it's not um, up to scratch, but from a um, sort of delineating the, the various things that need to be described, you know, the uh, is it complete in that way? It's, it's certainly not complete, uh, which okay. is the reason why both we and, and the RDKB have extended it dramatically, uh, simply because it's too slow. Uh, you have to go back to the broadband forum for uh, for everything and start a meeting and start discussing the features. Uh, you also can't have really dynamic behavior. It's an example, for 
offered is a uh, band steering and client steering. Uh, if you want to implement that as something external, something on top of the management layer, on top of this TR181 uh, object, well, one of the things you need is that you need to get uh, beacon, uh, sorry, a probe requests coming in from, from stations, from clients, dynamically. They'll come in, they'll start scanning, and you need to detect that they're there to see if that station is in the vicinity, how close it is, if it's on 2.4 or on 5 gigahertz for, for band steering purposes. There is no way you can capture that in a static data model and then send some sort of an event that needs to go real time through the entire thing. So the uh, really fast real time requirements tend to bypass that layer altogether. I see. Oh, I did. I did want to. I realized I didn't actually respond to Felix's um, comment about you know um, the scope. I, I completely agree with you that we have to be very clear in the scope, um, particularly uh, even more for the the, the bus uh, API and the bus uh, object model. Uh, in particular, I think one of the things is is if you're going to do some of the some of the low level hardcore things that you can do with say OpenWRT, you're probably not going to go through this. It doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. It's simply to um, these are these are tend to be somewhat not, not I don't want to say esoteric, but they're very low level things. This is more useful for things that are are very I think a lot of like UI related things they're going to be doing this. Maybe some things that are services that connect between different devices. It's probably not going to be a lot of the things that um, if you want to get if you want to utilize all the features of say OpenWRT you're probably just going to use OpenWRT related stuff. You're not going to be going through this because you're using this if you want to move basically between different different stacks. So, so yep, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask a question about the wireless uh, driver stuff? Yep, absolutely. Um, so you said that you brought the, the chip guys together and they were agreed on a common approach of I'm not really sure what they agreed, but to, to use this uh, CFG 802.11. And um, just wondering, what would they have to sacrifice a lot of custom features, or is that um, is that is that a is that a really uh, is that an uh, are they amenable to doing that, or would they have to sacrifice a lot of custom or proprietary features of the chipsets in order to 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 make that to support that common uh, API driver? Oh, we have a, a water here. We have a long discussion on that in the first uh, SIG meeting. Um, there's, so there are, indeed, there are an incredible amount of proprietary extensions, and there was a certain concern from the chipset vendors, which is completely uh, fair, that when a new feature is implemented, um, they need to do something. They need to provide some sort of an interface and waiting for the open source community to catch up and define those interfaces in config 11 is going to be a problem. Now, uh, we addressed that in several ways. The first thing we said was that, well, you don't need to eliminate your proprietary interfaces. They can coexist with a config 11 interface, so you can still have your additional features. Uh, the second thing is that we buy into the uh, development of the, uh, the Linux wireless developers. And um, on Basecamp, there's actually a, uh, a meeting notes of a, a meeting of them, which shows that they are now extremely active in uh, the sense of new features uh, coming in from the IEEE or the, or the Wi-Fi Alliance. They're very active in defining um, in the bleeding edge immediately uh, interfaces for these. So if we could potentially get the chipset vendors to all agree that we involve the Linux wireless guys in uh, new standards and in new features, and there's some sort of a way in which we can out point out to them that, look, we're missing something here, then maybe we can have the standardization um, together of the APIs, of new APIs and features, together with the development uh, by the different uh, chipset vendors. Um, there was a third thing, and I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I think that's it. So they they can 
they can maintain their proprietary kind of driver, but also support a an industry common driver. But they would they would still put their most of their effort into their into their own version, would they not? Well, in the first phase, we'd be happy if basic functionality um, would be available via config 11. If you could just at least configure an access point and, uh, and do everything you need to do there <coughs> without having to do a special driver or special hardware abstraction layer for every vendor's driver, that would be a, a huge step forward. Um, so in order to get to the problem here, that I described before was to try to get to 100% coverage. If they do, if they develop new features, ideally in the long run they will converge on using config 11 for everything, and config 11 will offer for everything. Which means that anything that's going to be vendor specific should just be hardware specific, and not feature specific. Uh, but that's taking a very large step into. <laughs> Uh, into the future, uh, where we haven't set step one yet. Okay. All right. Any comments or questions, particularly on the on the presentation that I that I did, and anything else about this? All right. Uh, well, before we go to um, to uh, next steps, I, Walter has a has a diagram that he wanted to share that kind of just showed the uh, the complexity of the of the Wi-Fi situation both now and I guess in the future as well. So I will let you present, Walter. Eric, sorry, this is Federer yep. again. Uh, before we move on to Walter's presentation, yep. Um, as Felix was saying, so what exactly are the points that we can take from this meeting? Or should we prepare any kind of plannings in the way to move forward, or how to better address this? Because I believe that not everyone uh, has the need to to support different systems or mm -hmm. is even considering to do that. Uh, but uh, on my situation, so as you know, we really have a big demand for it. And um, I would like at least to understand if uh, anyone else is facing the same challenge or willing to, to support <coughs> in the future, or how should we address this topic? All right. Anyone else? And I know we've had a few people who have mentioned this in the past, that this is a problem. I, um, Eddie? And yes, uh, uh, Intel will be also facing uh, the same problem. Yes, uh, they need to support uh, OpenWRT and RDKB based systems. Okay, so, so it's, it's relevant for our environment as well. Yeah, because otherwise what I, what I really face that will happen is that, uh, uh, as always, and as it has happened since a lot of time ago, um, companies that need to have something available will do them by themselves. And again, we will have this split on each one moving into a proprietary solution without uh, sharing anything with the rest of the community. And on my case, at least, I really would like to avoid. Correct. I agree. Absolutely. Um, I, one one thing that I would, um, and we can get into this a little more uh, later, I think we may want to consider having this group kind of work in two threads, in a sense, have not, not necessarily subgroups, but there, there are members of this group who are particularly interested in the driver area or the very low level area. There are people of this group who are particularly interested in the software stack independent API area. It seems like generally everyone under understands the problems here, um, but we need to. It, it would might be good to work kind of separately and then merge together for you know meetings and things like that. But I just I'll give you I'll give you a chance to kind of think about that and then uh, as Walter does his presentation. Okay, I, I can already tell you that uh, I think it's a really a great idea. 
Okay. Well, thank Not you. Only because in the end, two of them, uh, the two points, uh, really concerns us and me at Vodafone, mm -hmm. uh, but also the fact that uh, having a dedicated group to discuss this and to share the ideas, also about the work that we have been doing, might be useful for uh, the community itself and might mm -hmm. uh, bring someone else to support us uh, with the work that we are now doing. All right. Thank you. All right. Take it from there, Walter. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, a bit more complexity than uh, <laughs> than what uh, Eric showed. Um, I, this was a bit of a last minute thing, so I'm sorry that it's it's a bit uh, um, well, I know, artistic, you could say, <laughs> um, in the sense that I haven't really had to convert that to something that I can uh, that I can share and send around yet. This is just something that, that I drew on my whiteboard. Um, at a high level, it's the same as what uh, Eric presented. So at the top, you have remote protocols. Uh, so you have like a, you can have like a web server running that presents a web UI. You have a TR69 client, an SNMP client, an AppConf client, uh, anything else as a as a remote protocol through which you might want to manage the wireless in general. It specifically, it could be something else for control, such as setting your SSID and your credentials, reporting, such as uh, Taking a look to see if your network is up, at what channel, which channel was selected, um, which other access points you see in the vicinity, how, how well, which are your, your connected stations, maybe even logging, getting remote uh, access. So that's the uh, the top layer. Between those implementations locally, terminations of those management protocols, and the rest of the stack, there is a bus. The could be the bus, in like in the case of uh, RDKB, could be. Uh, UBUS or directly UCI. Uh, potentially, in the case of OpenWRT or LEAD, uh, PCB is the soft at home bus. Those are the three examples I've listed here as well. So we have uh, OpenWRT and LEAD, who, who then, if my if memory serves me right, actually go and call the command line utilities, like I have IW here, uh, IP root 2, etc. RDKB have a daemon on the DBUS that presents a TR181 derived data model. And they and this daemon links with a, an implementation of a lift Wi-Fi, which is then uh, done, which is a hardware abstraction layer. And this is implemented by one particular um, hardware vendor who will make it work with the management of its wireless driver. Uh, one of the problems pointed out with that is that it's very common to have a different chipset on 2.4 gigahertz and on 5 gigahertz, in which case you have to create an additional translation layer to abstract that you actually have two whole implementations. Um, our soft at home API behind uh, PCB has a general network um, manager interface and then, which then goes to a to the specific implementations, the the, the hardware abstraction inter implementations of the various wireless chips. Um, so there's a somewhat similar uh, in that respect. At the lower layer, we have well, at the lowest layer, we have the antennas, the power amplifiers, the wireless LAN, uh, chips themselves. A hardware could contain firmware that needs to be loaded, could contain microcode that needs to be loaded will be provisioned with uh, board and antenna, antenna specific calibration. I'm leaving all of that out of here. That's being handled by the wireless driver. That's whatever level this is. I've drawn two, potentially two different wireless drivers for two different wireless cards. Um, that's not a typical model, but it's not inconceivable. Uh, I'm also leaving out the data path entirely um, because you could have Mac 8 to 11 in the Linux kernel here which will present, which will do a conversion from Ethernet packets, 802.3 packets, to the 802.11 protocol. Uh, it can also be done inside the wireless sound driver itself, like uh, the uh, the full Mac uh, driver drivers that, that are there, and it can even be done in the firmware of the wireless card itself, like in ATH10K and Broadcom have a, a few chips uh, that do that as well, and they're so-called Donald drivers. Uh, they're sh for sure not the only ones. It's rather typical nowadays. Uh, what do we have on top of that? This really should have said 
config 802.11, I uh, described it as uh, ML802.11. And via Netlink and uh, IOCTL interfaces, you then have three large blocks of uh, interfaces that you have. You have the radio management. Uh, you have the station management if you're a client. Station is a client on wireless phone. And you have access point management if you're an access point. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on station management. It has its specifics. Um, this is certainly uh, usable, uh, needed, and valuable as well. But for the purpose of uh, OpenWRT, it's mostly about access. And uh, RDKB, it's mostly about access points. You do need the radio management, though. So what do you have? You have a radio up and down, getting the capabilities, switch of your card to 2.4 and 5 gigahertz your regulatory com country configuration uh, to see in which uh, region you are, which means that how much with which power you can transmit up, uh, in which uh, channels uh, are available. Um, that's the country selection. You have DFS, which is a um, radio, uh, weather radio um, checks to be able to detect that there's a weather radio in the environment. You could get radar events out of that, seeing that a radar has been detected. Uh, you need to, before you can activate a channel, you need to clear it or, or you can do a pre-clearing before you jump to, to a channel at, a, at startup typically. Uh, you need to be able to send a channel switch announcement if you suddenly need to jump somewhere else to tell the stations to follow you. You can configure the transmit power, you can do channel scans in your auto, for the auto channel selection or the channel selection. You can configure a certain channel that you need to do. Auto channel selection itself is, uh, tends to be very complex it's, as well. Uh, there are many different implementations that will go and do channel scans and then detect what the correct channel is. That can be when you first start up, typically. It will go and see what, what is the environment like. You can also do runtime channel scans and dynamically jump to another channel. Or you can even have dedicated radios uh, doing constant uh, channel scanning to, to get to the to the best uh, channel available, uh, the, the Google Unhub, on -hub, for example, does, does something like that. So this can be very, very specific, the local channel selection, and, uh, and the higher level. For the access points, uh, there are many things there. Uh, there is the basic functionality, creating, deleting, bringing an interface up and down. Those are virtual access points. So these are BSSIDs, SSIDs, with their uh, security mode and their credentials. Uh, there's some level of control of what you have to do on your beacon frame, as in you could advertise additional information elements. You could advertise, you need to be able to specify what your serial number is, what, your, what the vendor is, uh, for example. If you're going to be doing something like WPS you, for pairing, you, know, you can advertise that in your beacon frame. Um, there's the information on associated stations. Uh, when they get associated, when they disassociate, the statistics that you can get on the stations, lost packets, retransmitted packets, uh, multicast packets, uh, received and transmitted data, uh, signal to noise ratio, the average transmit, transmit, transmit and receive uh, um, uh, speeds, things like that, their capabilities potentially. Um, there's authentication, uh, which in the case, let's not assuming web authentication, but WPA and WPA2 which means that you need to terminate the EAP, uh, EAP and EPOL frames of those protocols and then uh, do the authentication with that. That could be enterprise authentication, in which case there is a connection to an, to an external radio server. Uh, there is functionality uh, called uh, Passpoint for Hotspot 2.0, which means that there is a, this uses a protocol called ANQP, which can com communicate with stations before they're authenticated to identify a hotspot as really being a hotspot owned by an operator and not just somebody uh, randomly calling their access point something. Um, this ANQP is also used for the uh, upcoming multiband operation uh, that the Wi-Fi alliance is standardizing, which can advertise to certain, certain stations that, well, you know, we're available on 2.4 and on 5 gigahertz, for example. So you need to terminate the ANQP protocol as well. Um, those are really those lower layer interfaces. Uh, I want to make the distinction of access point management from auto channel selection 
and features such as band and client steering and access point auto configuration. Uh, band steering is the ability to detect that a station is capable of both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and then telling it to go to the other band. It needs a whole bunch of statistics from the driver for that from the uh, and it also needs a certain amount of low-level uh, capabilities. So it needs station information of uh, what is the single noise ratio and the, the, the RSSI of a particular station. It needs to very much get information on uh, if a station sends a probe request, it needs to get that. Uh, ah, here, probes. Client steering needs that as well. And then it has the ability to do certain low-layer protocols on 802.11, like 802.11v to tell the station, please move somewhere else. 802.11k of, well, what is the environment like when where you're seeing it or trigger it to some probe request. You can have a higher level, which is client steering, which means that you don't, you're not only selling a station uh, locally on your hardware. Um, to move between the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band, you might be pushing them to a remote access point. For that, of course, you need a network protocol. There are a few of them that are being used. Uh, we're using MQTT. Uh, two of the vendors in, in this meeting are using uh, co-op. Uh, one of the vendors in, in this meeting is using IEEE 1905.1, and there are a bunch of proprietary alternatives to as well. Uh, there's no standard at, uh, at this level which means that you basically need the same thing for client steering as you do for band steering. And on top of that, uh, you might want to use uh, fast BSS transitions with 802.11r, which introduces a whole complexity of synchronizing your keys between your access points remotely and locally. Um, and you will typically also, whenever there is an access point configured, an SSID, um, credentials, and a security mode, you want to be able to push that to those remote access points automatically because they are slaves of your system or receive them. I mean, this can apply to uh, a slave as well, of course. Uh, there is a one standard for AP auto configuration in IEEE 1905.1, um, but typically those doing client steering are using uh, proprietary extensions to push that via their protocol as well. Did I cover it all? Yeah, okay, so now that I've covered all the lower layers, there's the question of, okay, so the management layer, um, what do you all want to cover? Do you want to cover auto channel selection and the client steering, the band steering, AP auto configuration? You're definitely going to want to uh, cover management of the access point and of the channels. That's typically in here. All of these have that. Um, what coverage are, do you want from in the sense of looking at all of this functionality at the lower layer that is being sent sometimes to like uh, the channel selection, client and band steering, which um, for those lower layer protocols, you don't want to necessarily terminate that in a single management layer. If you do want to do that, that means that all of these blocks, band steering, client steering, AP auto configuration, channel, auto channel selection, will have to sit on top of this and communicate with the management layer and ask it for something. That's what you can do if you have 100% coverage and you have a really efficient implementation in that you can pass through everything. But you might not want to do this. You might want to go have all these lower layers. It would certainly restrict the complexity of the management layer. There's no management layer today that exposes all of these. They're all a fraction of what you need to do at these levels. Hence, the suggestion to use config 802.11 uh, because config 802.11 does have all of these functions. Uh, WPA supplicant for station management, host APD for access point management and uh, the radio management are capable of communicating at the lower layer with all of these. If you're going to create a uh, a solution that is, uh, if you're going to not have a standard interface at this layer, you're either going to say that, okay, well, we are going to do implementations of these functions on top of a very, very advanced wireless management layer, or you're going to re-implement all of these in um, for every wireless driver that you have. So that was the point from the 
after the previous discussion where this, the question was, well, should we standardize at the driver layer or should we standardize at the wireless management layer? And with a, as an example, the RDKB uh, interface. All right, I, I, I see what you're saying, Walter. Um, I, I think that uh, to um, sum that up, if I'm not to jump too far ahead, is that the we're standardizing, you would propose we standardize as low level as possible. And um, if the management layer has a, if there's another um, API object model, the management layer, that's fine, that's okay, it can go on the bus, but you're not going to do everything through that. Am I correct on understanding that? Yes, that's correct. That's the point. Okay. All right. Any questions, comments from anyone? All right. Well, we have 10 minutes left. Um, now that we've, we've summarized this, I think it would be good to kind of look at next steps like Pedro mentioned. And what I propose um, is that we we do both of these. We're, we're going to standardize, we should standardize at this low level so that we can simplify the stacks in between um, because there's people that want to do very low level stuff and those are both open source and um, and proprietary and to address the higher level management API. And we say management in the sense of it's your, you know, UIs and 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 you know some of those things that you want to share between platforms. Um, does anybody uh, is there anybody here who says no? We should not do those two things. Hi Eric, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do them. I'm just I was on mute. I, I was going to ask a question in okay. terms of yep. configuring to eleven. Mm -hmm. How many SLCs currently provide that as an interface <clears> layer? Because obviously, if, if it's key to the low-level interface, it, it's contingent on them providing that layer for it for it to work. Um, I right. as a, I can I can say that uh, the that currently uh, I know Intel does. Am I correct, Eddie? I think you're still here. Yes, you you're talking about the web, web interface. Yes. CFG 8 or 211? Yeah, it's uh, partially it's already uh, used, okay, and uh, some proprietary stuff uh, is configured to be IWP if I, I yeah. Okay, yes. So Intel does, uses it, uh, Qualcomm says they're going, they've committed to, to moving to that and so has Broadcom, to it, at least supporting it as well as their proprietary, if not using it solely. So, um, okay. I, I would say, Ian, that I, I don't think it's it's like we're going to say one day everyone's going to use CFGA 0211 and therefore all of our problems are going away or everybody's going to start using it tomorrow. It's it's getting commitments to move towards this a, in a you know a fairly um, rapid pace. Um, so so it's not like it's going to just simplify everything. I would agree right away. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other comments or questions? All right. So just, to, yep. just to add one comment, uh, uh, Eric. So config to 211 provides some basic uh, uh, common APIs and common standard methods. So that mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we support and many others as well support. But Wi-Fi is a complex of system as um, uh, Walter described. And there are a lot of features which are upcoming and some things are under development. There are different variants. So and there are tons of private IOCTLs as well existing. So they are getting reduced, but it is not going away. So if we are targeting mm -hmm. for the complete uh, drop of private IOCTL, then this will take time. Uh, I don't think we are uh, uh, the Wi-Fi uh, ecosystem in the Linux framework is ready to drop IW pre completely. <laughs> I just wanted to bring in this. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, well, IWPriv 
could be dropped because um, NL802.11 actually has an equivalent of it. It has the test mode equivalent. It's uh, not as accessible to user space, so there's no like standard tool to just set arbitrary parameters. So you would have, need to have a user space tool that goes along with this private API. But it is at least possible to, to drop the long obsolete wireless extensions that way. Um, and in terms of standardization, uh, of course, it's going to be um, a bit tricky to find the right trade-off in how long something that gets put into the private API should be supported. Um, and of course, yeah, I, what, I, what I think is also important is to, to have as many incentives as possible in engaging with the Linux virus community early uh, to get the required features standardized in NL802.11 and CFG802.11 so that uh, there is not too much need to keep things in the private APIs for long. Yeah, so I agree with Felix uh, partly here. Uh, if you see config 802.11, even the recent kernel versions, they, they keep adding some new commands every now and then. So uh, either the, the driver is keeping pace of this and always on the bleeding edge of this like kernel 4.9 or wherever, and it is trying to use. Otherwise, whenever there is gap, uh, because of this IW priv, it is a, a alternate uh, uh, mechanism available for using this private IOCTLs, right? So this is quite handy to develop some new features and uh, uh, I mean provide this uh, for some advanced cases. But it is not needed for some basic configurations which are already covered in config 11 right? So I think we have to look at the equivalent feature-wise where all we see the gaps and where we have direct mapping. Uh, Wi-Fi is complex subsystem. I know there are a lot of advanced features which do not find direct mapping. If you look from a station perspective, yes, they are covering most of them. But from access point perspective, if you see, there are many missing uh, pieces which do not find mapping. But I think this is uh, this speaks exactly to to the point that I was trying to make. Uh, I the biggest reason why access point is more limited on the CFG 11 side is specifically because so far the vendors have not engaged with the Linux wireless community. They cannot just wait for the community to define things that they haven't even told the community they, that they need. So this is something that requires active engagement on the public lists and posting of patches. And regarding the other point of always needing to run the latest kernel and everything, uh, that's also not necessary because with the uh, backports infrastructure, you can get a very recent CFG N0211, Mac N0211, and all the drivers uh, running on even older kernels if you're tied to a specific kernel <coughs> version by the BSP. I, I do want to jump in and, and, and say that um, that that I, I don't think we, we expect everyone to completely get rid of all of their proprietary stuff, even possibly ever. It depends on, on how quickly these these uh, people or folks get their features into, into upstream. Um, but as Walter said, in, in some cases, people can't even use CFG 802.11 for, um, you know, Turning on or off uh, a radio. I mean, these are these are pretty basic features that that are just simply is not entirely supported by some um, by by some particular vendors. So I think that that's where we're trying to get uh, a uh, some some common common uh, APIs here and use of CFG eight hundred two eleven because it is the is kind of the the preferred version. Um, and we can we can adjust the exact edges of that I think, but that to me feels like the general uh, solution here at that level particularly. But can I just sort of ask again the question um, that I asked before, which was, you know, if you have to use the proprietary um, APIs for you know a whole set of features, what 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 is gained by having the um, using the config 802.11 for the common features? Uh, you know, if you have to support both, why not just use the proprietary interfaces? 
and, and I'm just asking that as a kind of devil's advocate. I'm not. I'm just really trying to understand the the, the point here. Um, one of the big benefits to supporting CFG Editor 11 uh, that I see is, um, at least, there's a lot of benefits to the to the entire ecosystem. I know that hardware vendors um, have over time always uh, been trying to push for keeping things proprietary to also try to convince customers to not switch to different platforms because they've invested too much in a particular proprietary layer. But if you get as much as possible functionality uh, in CFG 8.0 to 11, or at least if some vendors start doing that, those will be the vendors where integration uh, for customers will be a lot easier because they finally see something where uh, they can use standard APIs instead of having to figure out the custom stuff of the day. And uh, I think if we get to that point, then the, uh, the market will sort it out because CFG Editor 11 will just be much less of a hassle than the proprietary API. Oh, I thought though the, the argument was that they will still have to use the um, custom APIs for a certain set of features. So, so given yeah, that, it, it, it I think that there are two aspects. Uh, I think there are two aspects. So first thing is this: uh, IW Prev existed even before Config 8.0.11, to NLA 2.11, to and Mac 8.0.11 to uh, became a standard thing in the Linux. So this came recently. I think uh, not more than, uh, I mean, maybe eight years or so. And this uh, private IOC TLs of IW Pre when these things are existing ever since. So of course these things are, uh, I mean, happening and everyone is trying to support this. But there are gaps. So I mean, it's not like Ethernet interface or some other standard interfaces which are bare minimum and you can live with this. IW Pre was brought through this Linux wireless tools long back, and they were supporting any kind of IOC TLs you can expose, and that framework existed. So, I mean, even in terms of chronology, if you see, because this came later and that existed before, so transitions are happening, but uh, it's not one is to one replacement. Yeah, and I, I just would like to make another point uh, quickly. So, with the with the IW Priv, I, I guess one of the reasons why it's so widely used is it basically standardizes almost nothing. So it. The wireless extension itself is way too limited to provide any decent standard functionality, and it basically puts the responsibility of the, uh, onto the implementer. And I think this is also a very strong reason why the kernel developers actually want to get rid of that. So at some point, once more drivers are converted or removed out of the tree that are still based around the old concepts, uh, the wireless extension will be scheduled for removal at some point, and uh, the kernel developers will pay no attention to out of three developers still using it because that's not relevant for these kind of decisions. So it is going away anyway. That's not going to solve the problem, though. You're still going to have um, wireless drivers, like the, the, the Broadcom wireless driver, for example, exposes, exposes a character device. And then they have their own utility uh, that does um, hundreds of different defines hundreds of different IOCTLs through that. So the, you might right, not be using your proof, but you could still use something else. Right. They might use something else, but if uh, if we have vendors committed to providing some CFG 8.0.11 support, and up to the point where the basic functionality uh, works properly, and you get uh, some vendors uh, at least adding decent support for, for, for the CFG Editor 11 API, I think uh, if we reach that point, then the market will probably sort out the rest because it's just going to be much less of a hassle. I, I don't want to don't Maybe, cut... And then you're going... Oh, sorry, I don't want to cut this off, but we, we are, we're, we're actually past our scheduled time of an hour and a half. Um, if we can, I just want to talk about next steps. And what I would recommend is we need to continue this discussion and we need to be able to move this forward. So what I would suggest is that we um, post on on the um, carrier interest group a group to work on the low-level APIs and to work on the, um, the management uh, through the bus APIs. And we talk about 
in parallel and then come back together, you know, report every so often um, and to make some progress on these topics to, to get not only define what the API should be, but then work to actually get commitments from, from vendors and, and folks to, to get that. And we have some of that already, I think. Um, does that seem like, like reasonable to, to everybody here? All right. All right. Um, so uh, what I think we should probably meet about uh, um, every other week, each of these groups, and uh, we can organize uh, who wants to be involved in them. I would recommend um, that it not just be uh, the chairs or, or, or myself wanting to kind of, you know, head these up. I would recommend that the people who are the most interested in these topics to just kind of drive this as much as possible could, because um, we need to, we need to move, move towards uh, conclusions and, and making some good progress. And we've, we've done good so far, but I really want to really want to urge everybody. So I will uh, work, uh, I would encourage people to go onto Basecamp and say, or say now, if you are interested in kind of being the, I don't know, a, a chair of these subgroups, and that's probably a little too heavy to even call it that. Um, is there anybody here who's particularly interested in the low level API discussion? Sure. Felix? Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Uh, that, that's great. We'd love to have you have you do that. Um, so we will, uh, I will talk, work it out with you on, on scheduling. Um, is there anybody else, uh, is there anybody who wants to kind of just lead the, uh, um, the high level, uh, that high level management level API discussion? I just have a good evening. That could be you. Uh, yeah. Uh, did somebody else uh, suggest something as well? But, um, because... I think we also lost. Or no, we, we... go ahead, Felix. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to quickly point out that I don't know. Um, I, I would like to be strongly involved with the low-level discussion, but I don't know if I will have in, uh, enough time and uh, to to kind of lead these discussions oh. continuously. Okay. So I just would like to. Uh, be strongly involved with them, but if somebody else wants to pick it up and uh, head on with that, uh, I would prefer that. But if nobody else volunteers, uh, I'd be happy to to help to a large degree. All right, sounds good. Um, we could be each other backups. Sounds good. All right, all right. Well, then I will. We will get started with that and help both of you uh, help the the chairs organize. Um, organize these meetings and uh, then we will we'll continue there and, and then I, I'd like to, hopefully we can make some progress on this before we um, in the next you know month or so and uh, in the meantime I will start uh, really scheduling that um, we're talking about having an in-person carrier interest group meeting I think that this would be perfect for these things to just keep working on these in person um, and, you know, as, as, as Voitech says, we seem to make a lot more progress when you meet in person anyway. Um, so I think if we, if we kind of uh, have these groups running in parallel, we can, we can move some things forward. We can actually get the, uh, make the in-person meetings very productive and, uh, and we'll schedule those. I would have to say that's probably now going to be a little closer to middle of May or maybe a little later. So um, we can do that and we'll go from there. Sound good to everyone? Any any dissent? Sorry, Eric, before we close, yep. who is the person to say yes to the high level API? That was me, Walter Clusen of Soft at Home. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anyone uh, who is going to, to help or to to coordinate this? I mean, I'll, I'll help coordinate, but we can we can have more people certainly. Um, and I would, I mean, would you be interested in that, Pedro? Of course, I would like to, as you know. So I have um, uh, also the uh, the part of uh, being participating on this. I really want to participate and to to discuss and to share ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I was more interesting to understand. So if anyone else was really uh, also willing to, to lead this topic or, or to help how to coordinate this? I, 
Sucre was having some problems with his mic, but he did just say in the chat that that Inteno would be would be happy to kind of lead that as well. So um, okay. we'll work out exactly who. But okay, good. Just because I also would like this not to get uh, lost in the time. No. Oh, absolutely. Totally understand. Okay, so then Thank we. You, Eric. It'll be uh, Sucru or someone at Inteno. We'll work out the exact details in the next next few days. Uh, and Walter on the um, the high level, and then Walter and Felix on the low level topic. And if anyone else wants to be in a chair or uh, or a leader, please say it on base camp. I'm sure where everybody involved would be happy to have more people in, involved leading it, but also discussing it. So, all right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining then. Uh, great meeting. Fantastic. Uh, great to have everyone here. And uh, we will, the Purple WRT will have a meeting again next week. Um, and then uh, the carrier interest group, uh, the subgroups will set up their, their meetings uh, in the next uh, few days or into the next week to set those up. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Bye. It was a great presentation, by the way. Thank Bye. you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye.